Hi everyone! Before we dive into this week's episode, please check out our promo of the week. Hello everyone, this is Megan. And this is Alana. And welcome to Tea Time Crimes, a podcast where every week you hear a refined and bold tea review from our expert Alana. You know, it tricks you because it sits delicately, but then as it goes down, you can feel the body and it really lingers. With the natural pairing of a horrific murder, she murdered at least 14 people. Ew. But they still dig in. So join us each week to hear the story of a woman through the lens of murder and mayhem and hear two friends having the time of their lives. You know I hate true crime, right? Mm, Are you sure? Yeah. Anyway... Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Tea time crime, out. Divers. I'm Laura. And I'm Jill. And this is season six. Welcome to season six, yeah. Yay, we're back after our break. Yeah, we have been off for um, four weeks, I think we. Yes. We had off. Although a little more because we'd obviously pre recorded a few. Yeah, before. but to our listeners, we've been away yes, for four weeks. We have been. But we did put um, some other podcasts took over yes. um, our feed or whatever you want to call it, our channel. I don't know what you call it. Well, they just. They took over, so hopefully... It was a a, a takeover. Yeah, it was an episode. We had four episode takeovers, so hopefully you'll have enjoyed those and maybe, you know, maybe went over and give them a listen. Mm -hmm. But we are back now. We are back. Um, So it's us you have to put up with now. Yeah. (laughs) Laura's actually made it back safe and well because she's been to Florida. Yes. And, um, well, I'll let Laura tell you what happened. Yes, so obviously, as we spoke about, I was going to Florida for my holiday, which was fantastic up until we got caught up in hurricane ian so i don't know how well that was reported over here or overseas or whatever but obviously in america it was a pretty big deal um it was reported over here like obviously i had more interest in it because of you because you were there Mm -hmm. but so but for everybody else i think like it was on the news and stuff like that so yeah it was uh, it was pretty surreal quite scary at, mm-hmm. at one point um i mean i've never experienced wind and rain like it i mean i'm thankful that we were luckily in a part where there wasn't a lot of damage it was mainly just flooding um you know and trees and branches and that sort of stuff mm-hmm. but of course we did see the local news and, and the areas surrounding that clearly got a lot more devastation so for obviously yeah them, you were lucky weren't yeah you? so for them i mean i mean the end of the day you know we knew we were coming home to our nice house here mm-hmm. and you know a lot of places Exactly. Although you didn't know if you were going to get back because well, yeah, the airport it, closed, didn't it? Exactly, the airport was closed for a couple of days and it was right, I mean, we were stuck in our apartment for three days solid where we just couldn't go anywhere if it was closed. I mean, obviously, Disney was closed, Universal mm-hmm. was closed, all the supermarkets were closed. It was just really crazy. Um, and By that was, point, you just wanted to come home. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah. When, when, it, when I knew it was the end of my holiday and I thought, well, I just want to come home now. And thankfully, we made it home. Um, safe and well, which was good. So. Thank goodness for that, because I was worried, wasn't I? Oh, no, no. <laughs> I kept, luckily, um, you know, she still kept power. Yes, uh, we didn't so. lose power, but I mean, we had like hurricane warnings. I mean, my phone went off one day and it was like this air raid siren. I've never heard a sound like it in my oh. life. Um, but was, you managed to keep in touch with, with, yeah. with me, didn't you? Like, yeah. I, I never, well, anybody else who was messaging, but, but you know... I was worried, so uh, yeah, every time did, I... If did, I hadn't heard from her for a while, I'm like, are you okay? You know? Yeah, because I did say there was, like, power outages and, um, you know, like, could have lost communication, etc. Yeah. But, I mean, thankfully, we just had a, a very loud, crazy night with the wind and, and the rain, and, um, you know, we were lucky that we didn't suffer what a lot of other people sadly yeah. before did suffer, which I'm sure they're probably still trying to yeah. recover from that as it is. So, um, you know, there was some pretty... Awful, awful um, news reports that I saw. Yeah. Um, it did look really bad in, in, yeah. in a lot of places, but as it, like where Laura was, luckily, mm-hmm. you, were, you were okay well, with The you worst were. one I saw, I think, was um, there was like a cemetery and there was like loved ones, who ha- well, people who had loved ones buried in the cemetery. I mean, the cemetery was like flooded and stuff and, oh. you know, had brought things... So the coffin, would the coffins rise up? Well, I think so. Yeah, I mean, obviously, on the news report, they didn't show you anything. Yeah, of like, course. Yeah. But there was one guy talking, and basically, had they had come along to 
basically rebury their loved ones in oh a sense. Oh my goodness. Because, you know, it's that, that, that had obviously completely flooded the whole cemetery. So, I mean, that must have been completely... That would be horrendous. Heartbreaking. But yeah. on, a, on a lighter note, I, I'm not, it's not really a lighter note, but, you know, like there was things like there was fish jumping out about people's <laughs> gardens. There was like a, a walrus was going down the street. There was somebody <laughs> woke up to an alligator in their driveway. Oh um, there was a shark swimming about in one bit. Boats, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, it was... You know, some real crazy scenes, but thankfully, you know, I said for us, I mean, we didn't really see too much, yeah. thankfully. And, yeah. you, and you got your flight on the day that yeah. you were supposed to get your flight, because um, there was a time when you didn't know if you were going to be able to get home, well, you are going to have to stay for an extra couple of days, but she got home. Yep, I made it, thankfully. Um, and she brought me some nice goodies, some... I did actually bring you some, you done the best out of everybody I brought <laughs> stuff home from, you got peanut butter m ms um... Muddy buddies, Muddy buddies, Reese's pretzels, mm-hmm. painkillers, yeah. migraine tablets, <laughs> and my niece uh, brought me back a, a Ravenclaw pen, didn't yeah, she, she did. for Harry Potter, because uh, she knows how much I love Harry uh, Potter. It was so sweet, because we were in the gift shop in Universal, and she was also looking for herself, Yeah. Um, and she was like, oh, Auntie Jill, like, she would like a pen, and I said, yeah, and she, to be fair, she picked up the Gryffindor one, I went, oh no, I said, but you got to get her the Ravenclaw one, I said, because she's in Ravenclaw, she went, okay, she went, I'll buy it out of my own money, and I was like, okay, <laughs> so if, if that's what you like, then she went, yeah, I want to buy it out of my own money, so I was like, oh, that's, that was sweet. She does love me, she, she tells me all the time that she doesn't, but yeah, she does, she, <laughs> she does obviously does, she was thinking about me. Yes. But we're so, back safe and well, Yeah, we've had a nice break, and now we're back, back rare to go, for our podcast, so, before just before we get into the episode, um, I said just before we, as if we just came on and had had <laughs> blethered for like a few minutes there. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, this is podcast related though, uh-huh. so I just wanted our listeners to know that we are going to be taking part in a Scottish podcast collaboration. So this is going to happen in I can't actually remember. It's in December. Hang on, I am just going to look in my diary. All right, okay. Oh, I actually turned to the right page. So from. Monday the 5th of December to Sunday the 11th. So it's just a week um, where Scottish, a few Scottish podcasts are basically just kind of, you know, they're kind of doing different things. Like some people are like having other podcasts on their shows, maybe doing interviews with them or doing, um, maybe doing an episode, like an episode with them. Mm-hmm, yeah. Um, playing each other's promos, like, um, you know, things like that. So what what we're actually doing is, we um for that week we're actually going to be playing other people's other pods episodes. Yeah. So basically, it's going to be a a week takeover. Yeah. Um. So it's not just true crime. No, nope, there's other stuff on there. Yeah, there's um. But they're all Scottish. That's, yeah, they're all that's Scottish. The co- common theme is they're all Scottish. They're all Scottish. There's different um genres. Is that the word genre? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. And you know we'll probably we'll talk about it. You know, obviously near at the time, but. I probably am going to start sort of putting stuff on the socials about the the collaboration and things like that. So if anybody sees it, just in case they're kind of wondering what's going on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just a chance for... You just know, us, just, us supporting other Scottish podcasts, yeah, basically. basically. Just trying to help them, give them a bit of a platform. And, and them and give us a bit of a platform, platform you know. Yeah. Because yeah. we'll obviously benefit on other ways about whatever they're doing for, for their um, collab week, you know, we'll feature here. Well, there. yeah, exactly. I think I think a couple of them are going to play, um, you know, our episodes and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, our promo, whatever. But what I was, you know, it was um, Dawn from Scottish Murders. Mm-hmm. Um, she was actually our takeover episode last week. Mm-hmm. Um, she she's the one who's organising it, so hats off to her. I couldn't I couldn't do it myself. No. Um, I've totally lost my train of thought. I was going to say about Dawn. Um, oh, I've totally lost it. Anyway, the fact fact is, there's a collab coming. Oh yeah, no, I was just going to say I was as was, was I was telling Dawn when I was talking to her, <laughs> um, that. Most of our listeners are actually in Australia. So shout out to Australia. We love you. Love you. Thank you so much for listening. But it would be nice to get some more Scottish listeners. Yeah. Um, Because we have UK listeners, but we've actually got more American and Australian listeners than we do UK. Uh-huh. So it would be nice to get any, anybody oh, anybody who listens. But, you know, because we're Scottish, mm-hmm. doing, a, doing this collaboration, you never know, we might get some more Scottish listeners. Yep. So that would be nice. We do. Yeah, so without further ado, because I think we've kind of waffled on for about 
uh, eight minutes. Yes. I think we better shut up because, you know, we don't usually do that, do we? Usually no. we just get right into it. We like it. to get right into it. So let's get into today's episode. So, Jill, where in the world are we? We are in the... Well, the, the crime happened in Australia. Oh, funnily enough. Oh. <laughs> Australia. There you go. And the title? Um, It's called Murder in the Outback. Murder in the Outback. Mm-hmm. Quite fitting to be for an Australian one. Yep. <laughs> That's why it's called that. Okay. So shall we dive in? Yes, let's dive in. So, Peter Marco Falconio was born on the 20th of September, 1972, in Hepworth, West Yorkshire, England. So, the victim's actually British. Right, okay. His girlfriend, Joanne Rachel Lees, was born on the 25th of September, 1973, in Huddersfield, England, which is about six miles away from where Peter lived. Right, yeah, quite close. So, the, yeah, they met in 1996, so they would have been 23 and 24 when they met. Um, they met in a nightclub in Huddersfield and they began a relationship and the following year they moved to Brighton together. So Brighton is 254 miles away but Peter was studying at Brighton University so that's why right. they moved there. She obviously moved with him. So uh, She was working at Thomas uh, Thomas Cook Travel Agency mm-hmm. so she just transferred to the Brighton branch. Mm-hmm. They're bust now, aren't they? Are they? I'm sure Thomas Cook went bust. Oh, okay. <laughs> totally <laughs> not. Not that's sort of relevant in any way, but I'm sure that was one of the airlines that went bust a few years ago when oh, a few of the airlines remember. went bust. I've, been, I've um, went on holidays with them a few times as well. Yeah, let's do it. I think went, I went with them when we went to the Dominican Republic mm-hmm. and got a really good deal. Yeah, no, anyway. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure they're, uh, they're bust now. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so they obviously like to travel because they took trips to Italy, Greece and Jamaica. And in 1998, they started to make plans to travel to Thailand and Australia. So they were planning on going in the year 2000. So they were obviously like saving and planning, just planning for the trip of a lifetime yeah. for a couple of years before they went. You know, yeah, they were, which makes sense. Yeah. So their families were nervous though. They had heard of the backpack murders, which were committed by Ivan Milat. Have you heard, you've, I'm sure you've mentioned him before, haven't yes, you? Yes, I have mentioned yeah. him, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, he, you know, he was a Australian serial killer and he'd killed seven backpackers. That's right. Um, also, there'd been the Port Arthur Massacre, which you I covered. covered. Yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. Um, that was a guy called Martin Bryant who killed 35 people and wounded 23 others. And then in the year 2000, there was a fire at the Childers Palace Backpackers Hostel in Queensland, Queensland, sorry, and it killed 15 backpacker, backpackers. A guy called Robert Paul Long was arrested for starting the fire and he was charged with murder. So you can imagine. I can understand why there would be a bit of worry there. <laughs> I, you know, if my son and daughter were, or, you know, any anybody that I knew were like, oh yeah, we're going to go backpacking, I'd be like, no, because yeah. that's, well, that's admit, scary stuff. That does make me like, oh no, because <laughs> I mean, you do hear so many stories. I'm sure there's thousands and millions of people that have done it and have come, you know, back unharmed, etc. And they've had a great time. Yeah, they've had a great time. But of course, because you always talk about the bad experiences that you've heard of, then you do think that that it happens maybe more often than it does, I Mm -hmm. suppose. Yeah, just, yeah, I can can totally understand why they'd be worried. But, you know, that that wasn't putting them off because, you know. Why would it? Yeah, yeah. I mean. (laughs) They wanted to go. That was what they were going to do. So. Mm -hmm. On the 15th of November 2000, the couple started their trip. They were going to Nepal, 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 Nepal. Nepal. I would call it Nepal. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, Cambodia and Australia. Wow, that sounds a pretty cool trip. Yeah, so by the 16th of January 2001, so they'd obviously, you know, been to all the other places and that's, and then they arrived in Australia on a working holiday visa. Right. So they both found jobs and somewhere to live in Alice Springs, which is in the Northern Territory of Australia. Um, you know, so they found they, they made friends and they were um they were meant to be staying there for three months, but they actually extended their trip because they they loved it. Mm-hmm. As I said, they'd made friends, they found somewhere to live, they had jobs, like they were just yeah. loving it, yeah. loving life. Fair enough. So um, in May two thousand and one, Peter bought a camper van which was about thirty years old, so it needed a you know needed a bit of work done to it. So he started fixing it up for when they left Sydney. So they were planning on doing a tour of Australia in July. So they were going to go to Canberra, Melbourne, Adelaide, Darwin and Brisbane. Mm -hmm. So on Friday the 13th of July, 2001, Peter called his parents in the UK and they said that Peter and Joanne, you know, they were excited. They couldn't wait to start their trip. So the following day, they started out and they headed north on the Stuart Highway towards Darwin. They left Alice Springs about 4 p.m., And they stopped at a service station called Tea Tree Roadhouse, which was about 120 miles into their journey to get some petrol. Mm -hmm. 
So while they were there, they stayed to watch the sunset and then after that they drove another 62 miles towards Darwin, passing Barrow Creek Roadhouse. They continued on a bit further when Joanne noticed a few fires by the side of the road. Peter wanted to stop and put them out, so there obviously mustn't have been very big, big. fires. Yeah. And, um, but Joanne felt a bit uncomfortable and she's like, no, you know, l- let's keep driving. Mm-hmm. I'd probably be that I'd, I'd probably be that person. Like I can imagine Justin going, let's stop and put fires and I'm going to be like, no, can we just go? Can we, because I get all, like, I mean, t- sort of just to go off subject slightly, but when we were in Florida, we went to an uh, Orlando City football match mm-hmm. and literally we parked in someone's front garden like this. Huh? Like that's what they do around there. Like there's houses obviously around the stadium, so literally they just hold up their signs, and it's like twenty dollars <laughs> for them to park. Oh really? Um, so obviously they could affect like I think it was like six or eight cars that were in, in their front garden. So literally you'll just park, and they'll basically keep an eye on your car. Right. You give them twenty dollars, and then obviously even when we went back to the car, the guy obviously came out his house just to check that it was us. And yeah. I mean, but that makes me feel uneasy because I'm like, oh, this is a bit weird, just parking in someone's front <laughs> garden. And... Good way to make some money though. Oh yeah, I mean they must make a a good bit of money every every home game but I was like like and then Justin was like he's like your face and I'm like I just don't like that like, yeah. I, I feel uncomfortable so things like that I think I'd be the feel, same I don't like stopping and things but I don't know the place yeah. I'm not familiar with the place I'm like I don't like it so yeah, yeah um, we're just cautious aren't we yeah, yeah I think that's what it is I'm just, I'm just very wary of people I'm like oh so, well, you hear so many horror stories well, and exactly. you know we have a true crime podcast so, yeah that doesn't help so yeah that obviously makes us even more Cautious, but yeah, I, I think I'd probably be I'd be like, like, keep like, driving, and yeah. he'd be like, no, let's stop, and, and I'd be like, no, keep going. <laughs> to be fair, though, John probably wouldn't want to stop. He'd probably be like, nah, fuck it, let's go. <laughs> so they had smoked a joint at Tea Tree, so they were probably feeling, a bit, you know, relaxed, and their judgment may have been a bit clouded, mm-hmm. um, because one journalist said that he was surprised that they were still driving at this point and had passed Barrow Creek Roadhouse. Mm-hmm. Um, without stopping for the night because it would have been dark by now and there were lots of signs warning people to stay off the road at night. So that's sort of weird. That's that's just why I mentioned the joint because... Maybe they were that relaxed and bother yeah, them. Yeah, they were kind of like, oh, you know what, we'll be fine. Yeah. Um, so th- this was like a really remote area of Australia and it was cold as well and there would be like very little hope of rescue if you broke down. Right, okay. Um, be- because uh, unless there was like obviously passing traffic, which there probably wasn't... Um, the place was so isolated, there, there wouldn't be much mm. um, chance of that. Oh, see, that would make me feel uneasy. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> so uh, there were no lights on the road, so it was pitch black, oh, God, and God. you wouldn't be able to see a thing past sort of the light of your of your headlights. Uh-huh, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, oh, that I can I, I can understand why they tell people to keep off the road. Yeah, so that's totally. what the journalist had said. You know, most people would have just... Stopped at the um the Barrow Creek, yeah, uh-huh. stayed the night there, and then and carried, carried on, on in the morning. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm I'm assuming with hindsight they probably should have. <laughs> yeah. So Peter noticed some headlights behind them, and he was a bit annoyed because they didn't like take over. So I think like the, I think the the person behind them must be like right up their arse. Yeah, the, he was ca- probably the camper van. Them just to overtake and them. it was bugging them, which mm-hmm. understandable. Yeah, I'd rather just just overtake you and just like right if you're if you're that much in a hurry, you're at my backside. Just overtake me. Yeah. It's fine. Go for it. So after a while, the other car like, actually pulled alongside them. Right. And the driver indicated that there was a problem with the back of the camper van. Oh, God, see, that would just... I, I can feel the fear You're getting already. that anxiety, I can yeah, tell. Yeah, I can feel it already. <laughs> so just after 8pm, about six miles past Barrow Creek Roadhouse, Peter pulled over the side of the Stuart Highway and the other driver pulled up behind them. Mm. So Peter got out and Joanne stayed in the camper van. She heard sort of bits of the conversation between the two men and it was something along the lines that there were like sparks coming out of the exhaust pipe or something. That's what the guy was telling him. Right. So Peter then came to the front of the camper van and asked Joanne to get into the driver's seat to rev the engine. Uh-huh. And he, he then like picked up his cigarettes and he went back to the van again. He was totally relaxed, you know, didn't yeah. seem Faced. worried or, yeah. you know, anything like that. Right. So Joanne revved the engine and then she heard what she thought was the van backfiring as it had done in the past. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't a... A shock to her yeah. or anything like that, yeah. But the next thing she knew, there was, this man was looking at her through the window with a gun pointing at her. Oh, Jesus, not nah, nah. <sighs> So he told her to move over, the, over to the passenger seat and he got in and he tied her hand behind her back using manacles, which is basically just homemade um, handcuffs. So right. it's like used with like the cable ties right, okay. and that and tape. Mm-hmm. So the man then pushed her out of the camper van 
and then you started to try to tie her ankles together, but she was like kicking her legs that much, so like he couldn't do it. So good on her for fighting. Uh huh, totally. So he made her stand up, and then he guided her past the camper van towards his own car. So he managed to get her into the back of his four wheel drive. So she was screaming and shouting for Peter, but she hadn't seen him because remember it's pitch black. Yeah. Um, and she she had she, so she didn't see him like she'd went from the camper van to the attacker's car, so she had no idea where where Peter was. Mm-hmm. So. She 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 thought right okay I'm gonna shut up and like see if I can hear anything. Mm-hmm. So she heard some dragon noises, um, but she didn't know what it was, and she was uh, just absolutely terrified at what this man was gonna do do to her. And she was like, he's gonna kill me. Like I just know he's gonna kill me. Mm-hmm. So she like mustered up all her strength and energy, and she managed to get out of the truck, and she ran just, like she just ran like obviously pitch black. Didn't know where she was going. She just ran out into the bush. Wow. So. You know, she had nothing else to lose. She just, she just had, she had to try. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you can imagine, it was pitch black, no lights, no headlights for the camper van anymore. Jeez. Like, she was just running and had no idea what, you know, what was in front of her. Like, at the side, she had no idea. Oh, that just gives me can the you fear. Imagine? That gives me the fear. So she had shot off into the bush and took a turn and ran about 30 metres in another direction. And she crouched down, hoping that the man wouldn't find her. She must have been sort of hiding somewhere mm-hmm. in the bush. And he did go looking with his dog, but luckily he never he never managed to find her. Thank God. So a journalist called Roger Maynard, he said, quote, People in Britain and in other populated countries can't imagine how vast the outback is and how lonely you would be if you suddenly left your if you were suddenly left your own devices there, particularly if you thought you were being threatened by an attacker. It would probably be the most intimidating and scary situation to be in, end yeah. quote. I just thought I had to say that just to kind of get across how yeah. scary that must I mean, have been for her. You're right, I can't quite imagine it, but like just, I mean, <laughs> all I can compare is to watching films and stuff that mm. you've seen of that sort of thing. And I mean, to be... I watch films and I actually feel like I'm like, I, like you kind of feel the anxiety yeah. if somebody's like hiding and they're like, I know, I come just, out, come out, wherever you are, you know, they're like, I, know. I kind of feel the anxiety and like, I start panicking. To me, the fear of being chased, like I would, oh, no. I would just, Sydney. I don't like it. Like, I even like used to hate, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you did it or is it, because Justy's doing it sometimes, like, you know, like I'd run up the stairs and like he'd try and like, really like sort of try and grab my legs and run after me. Mm-hmm. I hate that. I just hated that feeling. So I don't like things like that. Yeah, Don still does that to me. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I hate it. So I don't, I don't like being, like being chased. I don't like. No. And I'm obviously, I'm, you know, fortunate. I've not been in a situation where somebody's tried to kill me, but just being chased. So I would, I would. I yeah. yeah I mean, I, I would think it's unimaginable. You can kind of. I don't think you could imagine. Like you're thinking about it, yeah. but I don't think you could actually imagine how terrified no. how much no, you'd I, actually I suppose be. Maybe, like adrenaline does probably kick in, and your sort of survival mode maybe. So maybe you can. Do things that I think that I wouldn't be able to possibly do because I think, oh God, I'd never be able to get away from anybody because I wouldn't be able to run fast enough or something. Mm. But maybe if you were put in that moment and it was like, well, it's either that or I'm going to get killed here, then you might find some yeah, I way think of... You'd be surprised at what people are actually capable yeah. of. Mm-hmm. So while she was hiding from her attacker, she heard some movement of vehicles. So she assumed, so she assumed they had taken the camper van away. Mm-hmm. And then she heard footsteps again and saw a torchlight, but he still didn't find her. Because imagine, because like, she's like, oh, he's gone. And then, like, a little while later, he came back. So, yeah. oh, God. Yeah, again. Um, and then he didn't, so he never found her. And then he, he drove off in his four-wheel drive. So, uh, Joanne had actually been hiding for about five or six hours. Oh, wow. And I bet that felt like an eternity. Well, yeah. yeah. Mm. And it was cold as well. Um, You know, it was cold winter temperatures. Mm-hmm. When she heard a vehicle, so she must she must have been convinced that the attacker had left at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, and he wasn't coming back. Because she heard this vehicle and she, she obviously just thought, right, fuck it, I'm taking a chance. Mm-hmm. And she ran out onto the road... And she flagged down this huge, like, road train railer. So it's like this massive big truck truck that's got loads of trailers on the back oh, or right, something. Okay. Uh-huh. Right. Anyway, this big fuck off thing. Maybe that's why she knew it wasn't him because she must have heard. Yeah. It must have been really loud. Yeah. Uh-huh. So luckily the, the driver, Vince Miller, he stopped and picked her up. But that would have been a shock to fight. I, I, that's the other thing that I've always had that fear of somebody, like, because I mean, you know, because I work. Sometimes it's six o'clock in the morning, so in the winter it's very dark when I'm on my way to work. Mm-hmm. And one of the roads that I sometimes used to go down, I don't go there anymore, but it's very quiet and you know, anyway, and I've always got that fear of like, what if somebody jumps out in front of me? Like, what if something's happened? And I, I don't know what I'd do. Like, would I stop? Would I drive? I don't know. It just it gives me that fear of some a person just jumping out in front of me in the middle of well, that would be the early hours of the morning, but like darkness. See, I don't think of that. I think of ghosts. Oh, see, I don't think of ghosts. See, if, I, if I'm going along like a, a 
like country dark country road or something like that. I would I was think like what if a ghost? <laughs> Whereas I think of real people here. <laughs> thinking of real people. I'm like, can you give a fuck about real people? I'm like, what if a ghost fucking jumps out? How would you be able to tell? You might not. You don't know whether they're a real or a ghost. Because then they'll disappear, or you'll drive right through them, or something. Oh my god! So you're gonna try and drive right through them? No, but there. like if they just jumped out and you hit them, like without you, you didn't have time to stop or whatever. Yeah. I don't know. But that's my fear. I've always had that fear of somebody just stepping out in front of me. There's a road just up, um, not far from here, that's haunted. And I know somebody who drove, and they actually felt like they were hitting somebody. Right. But when they got out of the car, because they seen, they seen the person, mm-hmm. and then they actually felt like they hit somebody, mm-hmm. and they were like, oh my God, got out of the car and there was nobody there. Oh, no. No. Anyway. Yeah. There's no ghosts in this story. Okay. So, <laughs> um... Yeah, so uh, yeah, so I'm saying I'm assuming that she probably could tell that this wasn't the attacker, as it was such a large vehicle, large vehicle, and it would have made a lot of noise, mm-hmm. like a lot more noise than a four wheel drive. Yeah, she would have been able to tell the difference. Yeah, this vehicle was like sixty meters long, wow. and it had like forty or fifty wheels, right, okay. so it must have been absolutely massive. Yeah. So that's obviously how she knew. Yeah, and as Vince couldn't like stop suddenly because obviously huge, you can't just slam on the brakes and yeah, stop. Yeah, a bit of time. Um, he actually thought that he might run run the woman over. He did, because right. she actually did run right out okay. in the middle of the road. So he managed to stop the truck about a kilometre down the highway, so he jumped out and found, thankfully, he hadn't run her over. Mm-hmm. So she told him what had happened to her and Peter, to her and Peter, and they started to look for Peter. Um, but obviously, again, it was pitch black. Mm-hmm. She had no idea, sort of where she was. Yeah, like how far happened. she'd kind of went from the scene, uh-huh. and she did, and she told Vince that the attacker had a gun, and he was like, right, okay, like he could still be hanging about, like no, nah, let's, let's just, let's just go. So it, like he drove her to the Barrow Creek Roadhouse. Right, okay. So owners Les Pilton and his partner Helen Jones looked after Joanne, and they phoned the police. Mm-hmm. Um. So the news anchor report reported. Quote, a huge manhunt is underway in the Northern Territory where a gunman is believed to have kidnapped a British tourist and terrorised his girlfriend, end quote. So within 24 hours, over 100 police, uh, volunteers, air, you know, aircraft have been deployed, like they were all searching for the gunman and obviously Peter. Mm-hmm. So police set up some roadblocks, but they weren't actually put up till maybe 12 to 16 hours after the attack. Oh, so so he could have, the attacker could have been long gone if he was. So did they go? Him. Did they go back to the scene? Because be, I mean, I know you, mm-hmm. you said obviously that you could hear because obviously one of the one of the vehicles must have still been there because the guy couldn't drive both vehicles, could he? Yeah. Did he have an accomplice? Like no, he came back for another one. Came, oh, he must have walked. Must have. I've, oh. Right. Okay. Listen, no being funny, right? But I've got a really bad memory, and I wrote this last week. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he ask me questions? Well, no, but he came in like, <laughs> and they were kind of in the middle of nowhere and he obviously drove off in one vehicle. I'm like, well, how did he get back to get the other vehicle? If it was like such a vast... They found it. Look, just let right, me get okay. on with the story. Sorry. Okay. Because I can't remember, so stop asking me <laughs> questions I can't answer. <laughs> Sorry. Where are you? Let me lose my place now. So one journalist said that they should have actually got Aboriginal trackers Involved right from the start. He said that the ability of those people is just astonishing. They can track somebody through vast areas of grass. Mm -hmm. And they were like some of the best trackers in in the entire world. But they weren't really utilised till later. Like, well, till too late, really. Like, they should have been right from the start. So there was... There was mistakes made in this. Always say when somebody's missing. (laughs) The first few hours and stuff is very important. (laughs) So police uh, released a composite... Composite? Composite, composite, that's it, it's composite, isn't it? Image of the gunman and his truck as described by Joanne in the hope that the public would assist in the identification of the, her attacker. But unfortunately, there was just nothing unique about her description. Like, this could have been anyone. It was pitch black, wasn't it? No, but she saw him in the... Remember, the headlights were on oh, and yeah. he got into the... Yeah, yeah, true. Huh? Um, the camper van, so the light could have been on in the camper van. True. Um, but, as I said, like I think it was just... It was just a case of... This could have been anybody, you know, just some normal... Mm. He's not got any... Um, There's nothing distinctive about yeah. him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And loads of people had that car, that kind of car as well. Like, it was a popular yeah. a popular car. So as police searched for the gunman in the hope of finding Peter alive, blood was discovered um, at the scene. And forensic biologist Carmen Ekhoff, Ekhoff was called into the investigation. She said, quote, Very quickly, obvious to me, there was an area that had considerable considerable blood there was more blood than you can what you can see visibly sorry i don't have an answer for that 
Sorry, that's my legs. <laughs> How dare you interrupt our podcast? <laughs> How rude was know. that? She's very rude. Need. Hey, keep, Did I ask you? Keep quiet. <laughs> She does all the time. See when you're just lying away watching the telly or something, and she starts talking to you. It's like, sorry, I didn't understand that. And I'm like, what the fuck? I know, maybe we should unplug her <laughs> in future. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, yeah, so there was more blood than what you could see visibly. And then as you could push away some of the top dirt to then expose some of the blood underneath. So, yeah, you can see where it's been flicked up to mm-hmm. try and cover the scene, right. end quote. So investigators found the camper van. See, I, t- I knew I'd get to it. <laughs> investigators found the camper van a little further up the highway, parked off the side of the road in deep bush, some distance from where... Ah, so do you think maybe he drove that, hid it, then walked back, got his own yeah. vehicle and drove off? See? Okay, this I, is, jumped, I jumped this, the gun. This is why you should just shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only joking. I know, but I, I, sometimes I just, I just expect... For you to tell me the bits at points where I'm like, oh, I thought you would have told me maybe about that there, and then but I get to it later. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, that's why I just you're a bit impatient. I know I am. I'm sorry. <laughs> I like to know. Well, I tell you eventually. Are you complaining? Sometimes. Well, stop it. Um, th- stop. <laughs> She's trying to hit me. <laughs> I did actually <laughs> raise my hand to her there. <laughs> Um, because she makes me lose my place. You've missed me. You've oh. mi- you've missed our podcast. See, yeah, I've missed it that much that we can't remember how to do it. <laughs> but let's, let's, seriously, if our listeners knew how many times it took us to actually get this going. episode going, it like literally took us about ten times just to just to do the introduction. Yes, didn't it? I did. But anyway, carry on. Oh, thanks very much. They don't care about that. They want to hear about the episode. <laughs> no. Um. Yeah, so investigators found the camper van a little further up the highway, parked off the side of the road and deep bush some distance from where Joanne had been hiding. Carmen Ekoff was asked to examine the camper van. So she used like she did like the sticky tape method, so you go around the steering wheel and mm-hmm. you know, get like fingerprints and stuff. Yeah. And the gear stick to collect cellular cell, cellular material. From so, cellular.org. <laughs> the low cost sticky tape method has the potential to be used for characterizing different airborne microorganisms and dust particles. Seriously? <laughs> She's helping out with the podcast. She's explaining about something. Right, I'm going to unplug her. Well, well done for the explanation. Yeah, thanks, I mean, Alexa. Yeah. Can you pull that bit out? Uh, yeah, she's unplugged. Seriously. <laughs> She's obviously interested in our podcast. <laughs> she's, obviously, she's obviously missed us doing the podcast as well, hasn't she? Good to see. She's like, I want to get in, in on that action. I know, right. She's <laughs> unplugged now, she'll not talk again. <laughs> um, so four days after the attack, Peter's dad and brother arrived from the UK and they made a public appeal for any information. As the media attention increased, Joanne seemed quite elusive though. Obviously, everyone wanted to hear from the woman that had been involved in this crime. Mm-hmm. But... You know, she was like, she didn't really want to talk. Mm-hmm. So Alice Springs was full of media from all over the world, from all over the world. But Joanne was just reluctant to talk about what happened. She didn't want to go into any detail about the incident. But of course, reporters wanted as much information as possible. So the police tr- tried to persuade her to open up and talk to the media, but she wouldn't. But I think she was just like really traumatised. Yeah, because I was going to say, because on one, on one side, I'm like, surely she'd want to help with the investigation as much as possible. But then on the other hand, maybe she was just that traumatised that she didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. Like she was in shock. Honestly, she's not used to... Well, you know, she's had a major trauma. Mm -hmm. And then you've got this media frenzy, like, in your face, asking you all these questions. I can... You're far away from home as well. I would think that must be a really... um, Can be quite intimidating. Yeah, intimidating. Mm -hmm. That's what I was trying to say. I just can't imagine how something that horrific has happened to you and then all these strange people are like they want to know every detail yeah exactly like i can i can yeah i can see why yeah, they're yeah, like totally. um so look then local journalist mark wilton got a call from his friend helen jones who was the owner of the the barrow creek yeah. you know the one who'd been looking after joanne uh-huh. she said that joanne had read the papers and she wasn't happy with some of the inaccuracies in the reports because she hadn't been talking and the police hadn't been saying much, the papers must have just been like writing anything, like yeah. just Maybe without any proof. You know, yeah. they were just writing without speculating all this yeah. stuff. Uh-huh. So, like for instance, like um, they reported that Joanne had said that she heard a gunshot when she hadn't said that. She said that she heard what she thought was the camper van backfiring. backfiring. 
So, you know, they've took that and said, oh, she heard a gunshot. So, you know, just things like that. Just, mm-hmm. just twisted it around. Yeah. To make it sound how they want it to make it sound. So, Mark was invited to meet Joanne for an interview so that she could clear things up. Mm-hmm. So, she wouldn't answer anything to do with the actual incident, as it were, because she had been asked not to by the police. They must have been maybe trying to keep stuff back, mm-hmm. you know, as they do in investigations. Yeah, to try and they didn't want the public to know everything. Yeah. So, um... But although the police didn't actually know that she was doing that interview, she was just kind of going off what they'd said before. Okay. But she felt that she should really do it as the police had said. But she said she felt that she should do as the police had said, but she did it mainly out of respect for Peter's family. Because mm-hmm. obviously... Well, they want to know where their son is at the end exactly. of the day, of course. So as, as I said, you know, any information that she's got might help them mm-hmm. you know, find out who's done it and where he is. So, 11 days after the attack, Joanne finally agreed to face the media with Peter's brother beside her. She made a brief prepared statement. So, this wasn't going to be like any ordinary media conference. She wanted it on her terms. Her terms were that she wanted a list of questions beforehand. So, she was given a list of questions by the police and she crossed 10 of them off, saying that she didn't want to talk about what those questions were. And when she talked to the police... Sorry. When she talked to the media, she said, quote, anyone that's spoken to me... Or has been in contact with me, no one doubts me, end quote. It's a bit random. So the way that she was acting and saying things like that just made the press kind of go, hmm. I think they were just like, hmm, this is interesting. Like, we want to know why you're being like this. What's she yeah. hiding? You know, is, is, is there more to this than meets the eye? Well, yeah, it opened up more questions. So mm-hmm. her conduct had beca- become a cause for concern and frustration and the public were starting to doubt her. Right. Which I, I can see that. Mm-hmm. Like, I can see why. So there were suspicions about her story. So in an attempt to put the rumours to rest, the police, for the first time, produced photos of her injuries from that night. Mm -hmm. So one journalist said, quote, Although there was evidence at the scene, there wasn't a whole lot of it. So there were still too many questions to answer. And of course, the police have to discount the people who are so close to the victim to start with, Mm -hmm. um, to rule them out. But I don't think they necessarily ruled her out entirely as far as the media were concerned, end quote. Mm -hmm. And he then went on to say, quote, I knew that the British press were tough, but it wasn't until I received that note back from one of the news editors, so many that I was dealing with, that said, we reckon she did it. (laughs) So, end quote. So he was like, okay, I thought that the English press were quite tough, but really, is that how tough they are? Yeah, they are. Uh, (laughs) British press are Oh yeah, oh yeah, they are. <laughs> you get on the wrong side of the head. Um, so after Joanne spoke to the press, wild and unsubstantiated accusations were debated, but that just for- forced her further into retreat. She was like, "No, I'm just." As I said again, like she was just obviously overwhelmed, and mm-hmm. so nineteen days after the incident, CCTV footage surfaced. Now there had been r- rumours of the attack had been caught on CCTV, but journalists were wondering why did it take so long to appear? Mm-hmm. Why hadn't the police used it to find the attacker mm-hmm. and to publish the pictures, you know, on the internet, yeah. on the news, or the pa- and the newspaper? Exactly. But apparently the police said the police said that they sent it away to get enhanced, even though it had footage of the truck uh-huh. that they believed it belonged to the attacker, and there was actually a man on it as well who they believed it was a, the attacker, but they still didn't put it out. Even though the car could have been identified from mm-hmm. it. Yeah, that's crazy. So, yeah, as I said, there was a, there was a few mistakes with yeah. this investigation. See, yeah, I so, could totally, not totally off subject, but again, just referencing being in Florida, like, what I noticed, like, there's obviously a lot of, like, sort of billboards around. Mm-hmm. And, like, literally, they will put on their billboards, like, say there's somebody wanted in connection with something, and that person's face is on there, <laughs> their name, and everything. It's like they just put it out there for everybody to see, because surely that's the best way of finding mm-hmm. somebody, isn't it? By getting... Why, why? I don't understand why sometimes policing that with keep information that, you know, can be put in the public so that the public can help him in the investigation. Mm. And then that, you know, that person's mugshot is all over the place. So he's not hiding. He's not going to be able to hide for long when somebody sees his face all over the place. But then if they don't have his face, because they said oh, they, yeah. had, they had this one, they had him on CCTV, but it obviously wasn't clear enough. Well, even the truck then, because somebody might have known, yeah, exactly. recognised the yeah. truck or known the registration or, well, if they didn't know the registration, surely they would contact the... Yeah, it said that it could have been identified, yeah. so I don't know. I mean, we we don't know. Again, I mean, we're speculating. Yes, which we shouldn't do, apparently, because I've been, I was reading something the other day there about somebody complaining about true crime podcasts and saying that the, um, that they shouldn't moan about the police, like, b- because they don't know the ins and outs or whatever, I don't well, know. Well, I know like. that, but I'm still allowed an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> so, a former detective superintendent for the Northern Territory Police said, quote, you know it's critical... Wh- 
that we tried to get the registration number of the vehicle and we tried everything, the most sophisticated technology to be able to do that. I think, and also in defence of the team, we were consumed with thousands of lines of inquiry. Where we went wrong is how we prioritised what was important and what wasn't. Mm -hmm. So it's clear to ev so it's clear to everyone that this investigation could have been handled a lot better. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I would have thought that was a priority. Yeah. The oh, I would have you know, thought, the car, yeah. the registration. But well, we, we have said many times before, like say, you know, we we don't we you know we can we can have our opinions, and you're right, we don't know the ins and outs of how these things have been dealt with in the police. So, I mean, I understand that, you know, they obviously do make mistakes and stuff now and again, but I suppose that one did seem quite obvious there. But. <laughs> <laughs> so, five months into the investigation, amid a task force shake-up, mounting frustration with media pressure and police procedure, a new lead detective was appointed. So, Colleen Gwynn got a phone call and was told, congratulations, you're now taking over the Falconio investigation. And she's like, oh, okay. Like, yeah. am I supposed to be happy about this or <laughs> yeah no because you know because she she said herself it didn't seem to be particularly well organised mm -hmm. so Colleen she observed for about a week and she said it was clear to her that the task force wasn't just wasn't gelling right. very well uh -huh. she said there were people who she didn't think were there for the right reasons uh -huh. and quite a few of them didn't believe Joanne right so she said, quote, when you're investigating a major crime such as this, you have to believe the victim. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you will get careless and you'll miss things. So the first thing I did was get some detectives on airplanes and go and follow up what I saw was the priority inquiries. And I think that's probably one of the best decisions I ever made, end quote. So she sent, um, like, as she said, going on airplanes, they went, um, Joanne had gone back to the UK, so yeah. obviously they were going to speak to her. Right, okay. So, as um, you know, Joanne returned to the UK. She was very wary of the police mm -hmm. and the media. She was angry, she was frustrated, she didn't trust anyone, and she didn't trust the police to be able to investigate the case properly. Mm -hmm. And the police admit it, it was because they got a lot of things wrong. Mm -hmm. So, Colleen, she spent some time with Joanne, and she was able to clarify some of the areas that were a bit confusing, and... Colleen realised that she had a remarkable witness. She said that Joanne was just incredible and through her recollection and her ability to articulate things that happened in the most traumatic event that anyone could ever go through was just amazing. Mm -hmm. so, Maybe she'd had time to kind of by then she'd be digest like, yeah. the situation and the initial shock maybe had sort of passed and mm -hmm. she was a bit more... But by then she was wary of the police because mm -hmm. how they were handling things and, and the media and everyone because they were accusing her yeah. of whatever they were accused, like not believing her story. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the task force managed to whittle down the number of suspects from 3,000 to 26 men. Wow. So they had assembled a DNA profile and possible identity of a suspect that they were particularly interested in locating. So they had a DNA profile of an unknown male and that residual was very similar to the DNA profile that was found on the back of the T-shirt that Joanne was wearing that night. The DNA profile was also found on the gear stick and on the steering wheel of the camper van. But unfortunately, there was no match on the national or the international database. So forensics test the manacles. Remember the... Well, the handcuffs, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, with which the attacker tied Joanne's wrist. There were a homemade attempt at making handcuffs with cable ties and black tape. So as I said before, even though she was handcuffed behind her back, she managed to get out of them. And a lot of people were disbelieving of that. Um, but if they're handmade, then they're not like metal ones that I need a key to get out at the end of the day, are they? So, I mean, it's probably, well, it is probably possible to get out of them if they're, not, they're probably not said, that well done or they're quite weak. She said that she was able to do it because they put an extra link in the manacle. I, I, um, Joanne had lip gloss with her and she must have been able to get that out of her pocket, so she'd used it to grease the manacles. Mm -hmm. So, because they had the extra ones, it obviously wasn't as tight as it should have been. Yeah. So, she managed to um, use the lip gloss to grease it and that's yeah. how she got out of it. Yeah. Um, but because of that, it masked any fingerprints right. that otherwise may have been found from when the attacker made them and put them on her. So mm -hmm. mostly it was Joanne's DNA on the outer surfaces, um, but further and underneath the tape, there were traces of DNA from an unknown person. So they had all this DNA. Police were aiming to find one suspect from early on in the investigation and ver verify his DNA. So this guy was called Bradley Murdoch, mm -hmm. and he was one of the early suspects in the hunt for the gunman. And he was interviewed by the police in a place called Broome and he and they had accepted his alibi. So he had said that he couldn't have driven the 1,207 miles back to Broome, like there mm -hmm. from Broome, because he lived in Broome. Right. So from Broome to the scene of the um, yeah. the incident uh -huh. um, within 24 hours after the attack. Right, okay. So they were like, all right, okay, yeah, you can live on that. So it wasn't him. Right. 
But <laughs> the lead investigator, Colleen Gwynn, said... Quote, it was clear that his behaviour and what he had done following the events of the 14th of July were odd and he changed his appearance and he changed the appearance of his vehicle, end mm-hmm. quote. Oh, no, it wasn't an end quote. <laughs> She's still talking. <laughs> Sorry, Colleen, I just interrupted you. <laughs> he was acting like a man who was running away from something. We should have, we should have made him more of a priority, end quote. There's a lot of would I should have cared on Well, this. the fact that if they, they knew that he'd changed his appearance and changed his van, I mean, sure, there's got to be questions asked of, well, why did he do that? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, maybe there was an instant reason, who knows, but surely you would make it a priority to find that out. Well, yeah, I mean... Which is also what she's saying, yeah. that they should have made it a priority. So Bradley Murdoch was 43, and he lived in Broome in northwestern Australia. He was known to the police as a local drug runner. In 1980, when he was 21, he was convicted of causing death by dangerous driving when he hit and killed a motorcyclist. In 1995, he was sent to prison for drunkenly shooting at people who were celebrating at an Indigenous Australian Rules football grand final match in the Kimberley region of Western Australia. He served 15 months for that. He was just drunk and started shooting folk. Oh, yeah. Lovely. So this was a lovely guy. Mm-hmm. So when they started looking for Bradley again, they did a, um, a reenactment with a similar car and they drove from the scene of the attack to Broome and they made it in plenty of time. Right, okay. So the police should never have took his word for it that no. he couldn't have done it. Yeah, they should have investigated the scene. So, yeah, that threw his alibi out the window. They should have done that straight away. But mm-hmm. yeah, it's okay. Mistakes were made. Mm-hmm. Bradley had ran off after the attack and he'd been staying in South Australia in the Riverland living in a guest house with a man, his wife and their young daughter. So the task force then got word that Bradley um, had been arrested and was going to stand trial in Adelaide Adelaide, for rape of a 12-year-old girl and also the ra- rape of her mum. Right. I don't know if that's the people that he was living with or something. I was just going to say, it yeah. sounds like it could be. It, didn't, it didn't say. So. Uh-huh. Um, lead investigator Colleen met him while he was on remand and she said, um, he told her, she was like, he was really intimidating, this man was like, Mm-hmm. But she was like, no, I'm not being intimidated. Mm-hmm. He told her that the man on the CCTV, because she questioned him about that, she said, yeah, that was me. But that wasn't on the night that they were referring to. But surely there'd be a timestamp <laughs> on that. He's always so stupid. <laughs> so Chief Court Reporter Sean Fuster said, quote, we were left with a truly bizarre situation. We were allowed to name Bradley Murdoch within South Australia with regard to the rape case, mm-hmm. but we were not allowed to link him to being a suspect to the Falconio case because, as the defence had said from the very start, their case was that this matter had been created, fabricated, fabricated, and that their client was being framed purely to get his DNA onto the public record so that it could be used in the Falconio case. Oh, so, because okay. obviously, like they they didn't have a match for the DNA that they had, so they're like. That's him. Right. We need to get him so on the database. So by him being accused of rape and stuff like that, that's their way of doing that. Mm-hmm. That's an awful lot of hassle to just for that sake, surely. <laughs> but uh, well, I don't know, because like, after little evidence was found to support the rape charges, mm. um, Bradley was acquitted after the jury's uh, verdict was not unanimous. But do they not take his like, fingerprints and DNA when you get arrested and stuff? I thought that was just a normal thing. Well, I thought that. So but... regardless if he got convicted or not, then they surely would have had some... Evidence of... I mean, his... they do now, I think. I mean, this, I mean, I mean we're still in the mm. early 2000s, so... No, they didn't then. I don't, but know. You, I don't know. I, honestly, I don't know. There's no point in us trying to... No. <laughs> um, so, where was I? Yeah, so the judge said to Mr Murdoch, you're free to go, because, you know, you've been acquitted. Yeah. But as the sheriff's officer opened the door to the dock, the Northern Territory police flooded into the dock. Uh-huh. And... You know, arrest the sheriff, sheriff officers away so they could grab him, uh-huh. arrest him and take him, took him into custody. <laughs> so they transported him to Darwin to face charges over the murder of Peter Falconio. So the police matched Bradley's DNA with blood found on the T-shirt that Joanne had been wearing that night. Mm-hmm. So in May 2004, two years and nine months after the attack, Joanne arrived back in Australia to face Bradley at the committal hearing. The press still weren't being very nice to her mm-hmm. and she wasn't thought of as a credible witness. She arrived in an unmarked police squad car which was driving at breakneck speed. Roger Maynard, who is a journalist, said, quote, and that didn't do her any favours whatsoever. Had she just come to the court, walked along the pavement in a normal manner, then everyone would have been fine. She might have got a lot of attention, but clearly, it, but it certainly wouldn't have attracted the negative public publicity that she got as a result of the car, end quote. Because I think she was like, 
I don't know, like, I mean, I don't making know. a bit of a show of it. Mm, maybe. Killian, the lead investigator, she said uh, about this, quote, there was issues with the transportation of Joanne to and from the court and, and her safety and the attention and the perception that she still wasn't a credible witness, mm -hmm. end quote. So during the committal hearing, evidence emerged about an affair that Joanne had in Sydney in 2001. Her reliability as a witness, police procedure and contaminated DNA, DNA evidence. And I'll get on to that in a minute. So Joanne admitted that she'd been secretly meeting another British guy, Nick Riley, for sex behind Peter's back in the months before his murder. So <clears throat> she would tell Peter that she was going to visit a female friend um, when she was meeting Nick and she had his name as Steph in her contacts list. So if, if Peter had looked in. Mm, yeah. Um, and they'd even discussed meeting up in Berlin. But any thoughts that he could have murdered Peter, were they were squashed straight away because he had already left Australia by the but, time this happened. Okay. So five weeks after the hearing, Bradley was ordered to stand trial. So on the 17th of October 2005, the criminal trial began. Peter's family returned to Australia and apparently Joanne looked a lot more confident than she'd ever done before. She was very much more professional in her presentation. When she walked up the steps to the courthouse, she even acknowledged the media, mm -hmm. which was really strange for her. So the, I, I don't think that did her any favours either. I, I, I don't she was just, just acting strange. I mean, but does that, does that allow you to be <clears throat> totally crucified by the media because you're just strange and you're maybe not wanting... I don't know. I mean, <laughs> again, unless you're in that situation, you don't know how you're going to react to stuff. So it might not have been because she's... I don't know. Like, it could have been the shock of the whole thing. and mm -hmm. But now she's like... Because it's obviously been a period of time past, she's like, right, I can deal with this now. And mm -hmm. They've got the guy I'm confident yeah, he's going to get. Exactly. I mean, it. it doesn't mean that she's, you know, been sneaky or whatever... I just, I just think it might have been a bit harsh, that's all. Mm -hmm. um, so Bradley entered a plea of not guilty and his legal term were confident leading into the trial that, and he looked pretty confident that he would be found not guilty. There were 80, 80 sorry, uh, witnesses called and more than 200 pieces of evidence. A surprise witness for the prosecution was a former friend and housemate of Bradley's. His name was James Heppy and he was <clears throat> currently serving a long-term prison sentence sentence so to try and reduce his sentence he has said to the police if you help me then i'll help you convict mm -hmm. bradley murdoch mm -hmm. so he said that he saw bradley tampering with cable ties in a shed which looked like manacles mm -hmm. and he also said that he remembered after the attack on peter and joanne bradley saying well the easiest way of getting rid of that body would be to to bury him in a spoon drain a spoon drain is like a sort of ditch by the side of the road, right. covered in soil, used to wash away water in like a heavy downpour of rain. Right, okay. So in the court, Bradley shouted at James, you're a fucking liar. <laughs> nice. And James shouted back, well, fuck you. <laughs> so there's no love lost between no, them. Clearly not, clearly not. <laughs> but, you know, like, was was he telling the truth? Like, because, was he just saying it because he wanted to get time off his sentence? Well, exactly. And, um... There was a there was a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar reward for solving the Falconio surely, case as well. Surely they wouldn't so. give it to a convicted criminal, though, well, would they? <laughs> After they had been shouting at each other in the courtroom, the case continued. Mm -hmm. So, according to the forensic biologist Carmen Eckhoff, the, the DNA evidence was very well prepared and presented in court. And even the three judges made the comment that the DNA evidence is watertight, and that Bradley's team wouldn't have wouldn't be able to have that DNA thrown out. So there was a lot of doubt about the DNA. Um, as not according to the forensic biologist, obviously, but you know, um, the defense team, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. and this, um, a forensic scientist said that Bradley's DNA should have been everywhere after the attack, not just on the steering wheel, mm -hmm. the gear stick, and Joanne's t shirt. Mm -hmm. It was reported that samples from the steering wheel, the gear stick, and the t shirt were very small amounts of DNA, meaning low copy DNA, and mul multiple individuals contributing to them. So the chance of identifying anyone could be very small. Mm -hmm. so, but as Carmen Eckhoff said, whether you believe in low copy number or not, ultimately it's the whole case that goes to court before the court. But you can't make up DNA pro profiles. It's either there or it's not. Yeah, it's fair enough. So Bradley's defence lawyer questioned the contamination of DNA in the manacles claiming poor police procedure and tampering of evidence. Apart from the DNA evidence and Joanne's eyewitness account, everyone else was circumstantial. Mm -hmm. In the final days of the trial, Bradley Murdoch took to the stand. 
The first question he was asked was, where did your buddy Pierre Falconio? But of course he was still denying murder, so. Mm. So after a nine-week trial, the jury found Bradley, John and Murdoch guilty and he was named the outback killer. He was sentenced to 28 years in prison with no parole. Mm-hmm. So not everyone agrees with the outcome, though. People still think that Joanne wasn't a credible witness and that the DNA was contaminated. Right. So Bradley unsuccessfully appealed his conviction, so he's still serving his sentence, but he's still claiming that he's innocent. And unfortunately, no one really knows what happened to Peter Falconio that night. So they like, never found his body? No, like, did, did Bradley Murdoch kill him or was it somebody else? Mm-hmm. Where's Peter's body? Mm-hmm. Like, what was the motive for Peter? What was the motive of just, like, yeah. pulling up and grabbing somebody and killing them? Yeah, no, like, what, what, was, the, <clears throat> yeah, what, what was the intention there? Yeah, so until Peter, until his body, either his body is found or someone comes forward with more information, we're never going to know what happened. Wow. I actually thought we were going to get a conclusion there, but clearly Well, not. I mean, legally, we got a con- like, you know, somebody is... Been convicted for Been convicted, it. and I pretty There's much... There's still questions. I think he did, because his, his DNA... Yeah, it could have been contaminated, but it was there in the first place. And did, it, did they discover it was his truck? Yeah, it must have been. Yeah. 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 So, so it does I, sound I like think, it. I, I think he did, but jo- uh, Joanne just didn't help matters. But as I said, yeah. I mean, she was... Tr- can you imagine? We can't imagine how bad that must have exactly. been for her. I know. <clears throat> so I think it's pretty harsh to be accusing her without any evidence, just because she was acting a bit strange. Yeah, and it doesn't mean that she was in the wrong or anything. She just might have... At the situation, maybe she didn't handle it very well because yeah. at the end of the day, who knows how to handle a situation like that? Like, exactly. who knows, who knows mm-hmm. how you'd react? So, you know, maybe she got a bit wrong, but then the police got things wrong. So people yeah. can make mistakes. Doesn't mean she's guilty of anything. I'm just hoping that one day when maybe they'll they'll find his remains and yeah, get awful, some answers. Yeah, because I mean, obviously the whole situation's awful, but at least if you have the body, you can at least... Yeah, with your closure. Closure, you yeah, can, yeah, but you... without a body... There is no closure, I no. don't think. So, you know, I feel sorry for the family because I'm sure they're probably pretty tortured by that. Yeah. So, thank you, everybody, for coming back to season six. And, mm-hmm. well, or if you're just joining yeah. us for the first time, if you're just enjoyed it. it. Yeah, welcome. Mm-hmm. Hopefully you'll come back. Mm-hmm. So, if you would like to get in contact with us, I'm not going to remember this because we haven't done it for so long. Yes, we Right, are. on social media uh-huh. or on Instagram and Twitter. Which is crime underscore divers, divers underscore, underscore pod. pod. Our email is crime, crime underscore divers underscore pod at outlook dot com. Mm-hmm. Um, YouTube Crime Divers Podcast, TikTok Crime Divers Podcast. Um, if you'd like to get bonus episodes, early access to episodes and whatnot, you can join us on Patreon dot com slash Crime Divers. If you want, if you'd like just to make a buy us a coffee, you know, just a wee one off payment. Um, it's buymeacoffee dot com slash Crime Divers. And if you haven't already. And you'd like to, please go and give us a... Five-star rating. Five-star rating. <laughs> <laughs> I can. But please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. Thanks for listening. Bye.